Imagine you're 60 years old with $2 million in your retirement portfolio. You're probably starting to ask yourself if you can retire, and if so, how much you might be able to spend. Well, that's the situation that today's couple finds themselves in. They've been so focused on saving and investing and growing their portfolio value that they never really stopped to think about when they might be able to retire, or when they do, how much they might be able to spend. In today's video, we're gonna jump into John and Jane's actual financial situation, uncovering all the different planning techniques necessary to get them to their retirement planning goals and show them what's needed to get from where they are today to where they want to be in the future, while also showing them the different possibilities that exist along the way. So let's jump in and as we do, keep this in mind. It doesn't matter if you actually have $2 million in your portfolio or some entirely different amount. The steps that we're gonna go through are the same regardless of your portfolio value to determine when you can retire and how much you can spend once you do so. So let me introduce you to John and Jane Sample. Names of course have been changed, financials have been simplified for the purpose of this video, but both John and Jane are 60 years old today. You can see John's portfolio value, he has 920,000 in his 401k, as well as a Roth IRA of $35,000. Jane has an IRA of $610,000 and her Roth IRA of 20,000. They have savings of about $50,000 and then a joint investment account of 450,000. And then they have their home worth about $700,000. So total net worth of $2.7 million, 2 million of which is in liquid assets. And they're now asking themselves, when can we retire? And when we do, how much can we spend? And not just how much can we spend, but how much can we comfortably spend? So that regardless what happens in the market, regardless what happens with inflation, we can feel really secure that we're not gonna have to go back to work or that we're not gonna potentially run out of money. So whenever we go through a financial planning process with a client, we always start with an understanding of what they want retirement to look like. Everyone's situation is different and the way that we optimize their investments, their taxes, their insurances, everything from a financial perspective, it first starts with their priorities and their personal goals. So when we went through this with John and Jane, we just started asking some questions. Hey, when do you think you might want to retire? Now, John and Jane, they thought they were doing pretty well with their investments, but to them, they just always thought they'd work till 65. They didn't really know what they would do for medical insurance before then. They just thought that that was the age you're supposed to work to. So we said probably 65. So we said, sure, we'll explore other ages to see if you can do this earlier, but let's start with 65, see if that's possible. The next question, of course, is how much do you wanna spend in retirement? Simple question, but a very difficult question for a lot of people. Now for John and Jane, they were pretty detailed. So they said, we wanna go through an itemized spreadsheet, help us understand what we're spending and how what we're spending today might change in retirement. So we did that. We said, let's look at utilities. Let's look at property taxes. Let's look at food. Let's look at entertainment. Let's look at the things that you typically do. How much might that cost? And how can we now project that out into retirement? That came out to about $5,500 per month on average throughout retirement. Now, the next thing that we need to plan for is insurances. What will their annual retirement health care cost? We always do a couple things. If you're going to retire past 65, well, what's an estimate of how much you might pay out of pocket? So after Medicare Part B and Part D premiums. So those will be one expense and that'll be based upon your adjusted gross income. But then outside of that, any supplemental coverages or any out-of-pocket costs, we assumed $4,000 per year, which is pretty close to a national average. But what we also wanted to know is if you do end up retiring before 65, you're not gonna have Medicare. How much do we need to plan for per month to get the coverage that works for you based upon where you live? We estimated that would be about $1,000 per month for each of them. So a total of 2,000 per month for each year, each month, I should say, that they potentially retire before Medicare. After insurance, the next thing we looked at is they said, we wanna budget for new cars every so often. So sometimes when people give me an average monthly amount that they wanna spend in retirement, they're already kind of including an amount that they're saving for new car purchases, or maybe that includes the cost of a lease that they just plan to continue to roll over. But in their case, they said, you know what? We wanna be prepared to pay cash for a new vehicle every five years. So maybe for one of us, every 10 years is essentially what it works out to, but for the both of us, every five years, there's a new car purchase. They said, we could probably sell our existing cars for five to 10,000, which means we want another 25,000 that we could come in with cash to say we have 30 to 35 grand to buy a new car with. So if we do that every five years, just for the first 15 years of retirement, that's another cost that we want to plan for. After that, we like to say, what extra amount do we want for vacation? And the reason I like to separate this travel expense out from just say general retirement expenses, is most people aren't gonna travel the same way at age 65 as they are at age 85. So it's for the first number of years in retirement, what's a budget that we want to plan for? 
I said, well, if we had an extra 1,500 or so per month or 18,000 per year, really they were looking at three trips per year that are around $6,000 total. They said, if we could do that, and if we could do that for the first 10 years, we'd be really happy. So that's what we're starting with. We're saying starting at retirement, could we add an additional 18,000 per year? Not forever, but for the first decade to ensure that we're fully covering your ability to do that. The next thing that we looked at was family. Family is really important to them and they love their children and their grandchildren like crazy. And one thing that they shared with me is they just had some concerns or some doubts that their children were gonna be able to put away some money for their grandchildren's future college needs. So I said, one thing that we'd love to be able to do is could we help with that? Could we help by funding grandchildren's college plans so that our children don't feel the pressure of trying to pay for a mortgage, pay for the cost of living, pay for their kids and saving for their kids' future? We didn't know exactly what that might look like, so we said, let's start with this. Let's start by saying, can we cover all of your other retirement goals? And if so, what's then left that you could contribute to grandchildren's 529 plans? So we started this at zero, knowing that the goal wasn't to have it actually be zero, but we're just putting this as a placeholder that we're then gonna see what would this look like? If it was five grand per year, 10 grand a year, 15 grand per year. But John and Jane wanted to see, can we do all these things first so we don't end up doing all this and funding grandchildren's 529 plans just to one day become a burden to our children and grandchildren because we've run out of money and now are relying upon them. So these are the goals that we identified based on a very personal conversation with them about what they wanted to be able to create. The next thing that we do is we look at their income. Well, John's salary today, he's earning $135,000 per year. Jane today is earning $90,000 per year. As we look towards the future, John's social security benefit, if he collected his full retirement age, so he's gonna retire at 65, but thinking probably collect social security at age 67, he would be eligible for about $3,200 per month in today's dollars. Jane at that same time, so also retiring at age 65, but collecting at age 67, which is her full retirement age, she would be eligible for about $2,300 per month. So these are the income sources that we are expecting. And then when we look at their plans, John is currently maxing out his 401k and getting a 3% employer match on top of that. Jane's company does not offer a 401k, so instead she's maxing out her traditional IRA and they're both planning to continue to do that for as long as they're working. So those are the details. We know their assets, and by the way, we're assuming an annualized growth rate of 6.5% per year but starting today throughout retirement. We know their assets, we know the assumed growth rate, we know their goals, when they want to retire, how much they want to spend, how much they want to spend above and beyond just basic living expenses. We know the income sources they'll have in retirement from social security, and we know the savings rate between today and that time. Now what we want to do is we want to put that all together to say based upon all this information, is this realistic? Is it realistic to retire at 65 and spend what they want to spend? And then based upon that, we can make some adjustments. What if you retire later? What if you retire sooner? What if you spend more? What if you spend less? What if you get higher rates of return? What if you get lower rates of return? What if you save more, save less? All these things are things we can start to look at once we have this base case plan in place. So here's what this looks like when we put it all together. This is the cash flow page. This is the page that I pay most attention to when we're looking at retirement projections. To start, we have income in these columns here, expenses in these columns, and the net flows is essentially saying, what is your portfolio's role in all of this? Where does your portfolio come into play? So let's start with income. Income, both John and Jane will have their salary for the next five years. Here's what their salary will look like, consuming that continues to change over time, and then salary goes away. Well, Social Security will kick in, but only after a couple of gap years. So in 2028 and 2029 for them, there's no income from salary and no income from Social Security. It's not until 2030 for each of them that we're planning on anything in Social Security. So if we drill down into this, Here's John's retirement benefit. Here's Jane's retirement benefit. So most people don't get a full benefit their first year because they're not turning 67 or whatever their full retirement is on January 1st. So if they're turning 67 partway through the year, well then you've got a partial benefit and then you can see that pops up to the full benefit when you have a full year of collecting social security the following year. But here's their total social security income. And when we go back to this, we can see total income these first few years is fully from salary then a couple gap years, then total income coming from Social Security. Let's now compare that to what we can expect their expenses to be. The first thing we drill down into is what will their living expenses be? 
Living expenses, again, we're assuming for core living expenses, just month to month recurring expenses of $5,500 per month, that's 66,000 per year. And you can see how that will increase with inflation over time. This is both pre-retirement and retirement living expenses. We're assuming that stays the same. Well, in addition to that, they have housing. Well, their mortgage is paid off, but they still have property taxes. So you can see what we're planning for as a property tax number above and beyond the core expenses of $5,500 per month. Then once they both retire, they will have healthcare expenses. Today it's fully covered through work, but what's this gonna look like when we have Medicare premiums for Medicare Part B and Part D? What's this gonna look like when we have additional out-of-pocket costs or maybe an additional supplemental coverage? Here's what we're planning for for the each of them or for the both of them in retirement. So what this really allows us to do is to control for all their different expenses, the timing of when those expenses come into play, how we adjust for inflation on things like medical expenses versus things like property taxes versus anything else. And so this gives us a total expense for the total core expenses. And then on top of that, we're adding in goals. Car is one. Every five years, they wanna be in a position to buy a new car in cash. So you can see how we're accounting for that and accounting for inflation. Vacation is another goal. So once they retire, and they won't retire till 2028, are they gonna start adding in an additional amount for travel that doesn't last forever, but it ensures they've got enough for that first decade plus of retirement to not feel like they have to second guess the decision to take a big trip. They don't have to second guess the decision to last minute fly across the country to see their children or grandchildren. They know we're already planning for that, and so that gives them more peace of mind to be able to spend freely in retirement on things that are important to them. So those are the goals that they have. Then on top of that, we're looking at projected tax payments. So based upon the age that they are, you can see they're gonna have higher taxes the first few years because they're still working and their full salaries are subject to taxes. But then the taxes, and this is assuming assets are coming from certain accounts, what might they be paying in federal taxes at that point? So when we look at everything, especially if we fast forward to the first full year of retirement, here's their expenses. This is basic living expenses of $5,500 per month, plus healthcare expenses, plus property taxes. Goals is a combination of extra travel they wanna do, plus the potential that they might be in a, buying a car in that year. And then tax payment is the projected tax liability they would have based upon where they might be pulling income from that year of retirement. When we add all that up, you get total outflows. Total outflows is our way of saying, here's how much total income you need to pay taxes, pay healthcare, pay for travel, pay for all those other things, and then end up with the $5,500 per month of core living expenses adjusted for inflation over the course of your retirement. So the next thing we wanna do is say, what are these total outflows? And then how do we compare that to total inflows? Again, first two years of retirement, they have no income outside of their portfolio. So zero total inflows compared to these total outflows means the entire amount needs to come from their portfolio. So you can see they need 127 grand that first year from their portfolio, then 128 grand. Then that number drops because social security has started to kick in and because social security kicks in, less of a requirement needs to come from their portfolio for them to maintain the same standard of living. So as we're looking at this, we don't want to just end with this. It's not enough to know how much do I need for my portfolio. We need to know how much do you need relative to how much you're projected to have. That allows us to benchmark. Are you taking an amount that is not sustainable from your portfolio? Well, if this represents, for example, 10% of your portfolio, probably not a sustainable withdrawal rate to take that forever. Versus if this represents 2%, 3%, 4% of your portfolio, that's a pretty sustainable withdrawal rate to take over a 30 plus year retirement. So that's why the next step from here isn't just to see how much do you need, but it's to see what is your projected portfolio going to look like. Well, if we look at your portfolio here, here's the starting balance. Here's how much they have in planned savings between 401k and IRA contributions, between an employer match, between a projected portfolio return. So that portfolio return is based upon an assumed growth rate of six and a half percent. What the software is gonna model at first is six and a half percent every single year. Entirely unrealistic. You will never ever get that exact amount every single year forever. However, you start with a linear projection to say what would it look like if you do, and then you stress test that. You stress test that using a Monte Carlo analysis to say what if we get a range of returns in any potential sequence of order. 
You stress test that by saying, what if we got very bad returns followed by good returns by modeling out actual scenarios that have happened in the past. But I wanna make it very clear that we're looking at here something that says you're assuming a growth rate. Let's assume you get that return every single year. Fully unrealistic to expect that year in and year out. But if we average that, this is the general projection of where their portfolio might end up by the time that they retire. So if we take these assumptions, starting portfolio balance, plus plan savings, plus employer match, plus portfolio return, we do that for five full years. What that tells us is this couple is going to retire with about $3.2 million in their portfolio. So now we have two really key pieces of information. We know exactly how much they'll need from their portfolio every year throughout retirement based upon our projections, and we'll know how much their portfolio is. So now we can start to compare the two to say, is this a sustainable withdrawal rate? So that's exactly what we're gonna do for John and Jane next. We're gonna say, what is the withdrawal rate of this plan? Well, what we can see here is based upon assuming an amount they're gonna take out and dividing that by the projected portfolio value, year in and year out in retirement, we can see the first year of retirement, their withdrawal rate's projected to be 3.9%. Then it's projected to be 3.8%. Then it drops to 2.5% or so. Why does it drop? Well, again, because Social Security is not coming in the first two years, which means more comes from their portfolio. Then as Social Security does start to kick in, less needs to come from their portfolio to deliver the same total amount of income. So as we start to look at this and say, okay, withdrawal rate's gonna fluctuate a little bit based upon are you buying a car, how much is travel, what are you paying in taxes based upon the account that you're pulling money from, it's gonna fluctuate a little bit, but what you can see here is it's in a pretty healthy withdrawal rate range. 1.5% to 2% or so on average, that's very sustainable. A lot of people will look at 4 to 5% or so as a sustainable long-term withdrawal rate, assuming you're invested the right way. So that's a big assumption. And what we see with John and Jane is their withdrawal rate doesn't really change dramatically until age 75. It's not because they start spending a whole lot more. It's because required distributions kick in. So that's why the tax plan is step two for them from here on out. But required distributions kick in forcing them to take a larger portion of their portfolio. Now, by the way, before we go on any further, will you let me know in the comments, is this actually helpful to see? Trying to dissect an actual retirement plan to show you all the ins and outs on the back end that determine, is this doable, is this not doable? Let me know if this is helpful. If it is, and you're not already subscribed, make sure that you do, because every week we're putting out videos just like this to ensure that you're seeing how financial plans are built so you can apply some of these principles to your own case. But that being said, as we're looking at John and Jane's plan, what we're seeing is we're seeing how does this withdrawal rate look over time? And if we put everything together, here's the actual implications for that. So if we look at this for John and Jane, and we look at this in today's dollars, here's their portfolio value today. They've got about $2 million. Well, they're gonna keep saving and keep growing. And by the time they turn 65, like we saw, they're probably gonna have around $3.2 million there based upon the projections we went through. And even though they stop saving at that point, they're taking a, a low enough amount, a small enough amount out of their portfolio relative to their portfolio value, their portfolio value is just projected to keep growing over time. If you've watched any of my videos before, you've heard me say, this is not the goal. The goal isn't to say, John and Jane, I want you to die with $9 million in your portfolio plus whatever your home was worth at that time. The goal is to say, how do we get the most life out of our money? How do we use this in a way that aligns with what's most important to us? So this is where some really cool conversations happen of, of what does align with what's most important to you. Well, there could be a number of things. The first thing we look at is we say, John, Jane, I know you told me 65 is when you want to retire, but I think that was probably less because it was a burning desire to work until 65 and more you just thought you needed to because of health insurance. Well, keep in mind, we've already planned for if you do retire before 65, we've budgeted in an extra $1,000 per month for each of you to go pay for a private insurance policy before Medicare kicks in. So what if we did take this and say, what if it wasn't 65 that you worked to, but what if it was 62? Could this still happen? And we start to look at this and say, yeah, you have two and a half million fewer dollars at age 90 than you otherwise would have, but you're still projected to be on a great track. Now, what if we look at this and say, John and Jane, could you go turn in your notice today and be done working if you wanted to? And what we'll see here is you'll see the answer is also yes. You have four million fewer dollars than you otherwise would have at age 90 under these assumptions, but you're still in a strong position to make that work. Now, this isn't me telling John and Jane to go retire. 
but sometimes knowing that you're one bad day away, two bad days away at work from being able to retire feels really good. You start to worry less about some of those things that are out of your control at work. You maybe stop putting up with less at work that you otherwise would have. So for John and Jane, they weren't planning on retiring, but just knowing that they could, there was a huge burden lifted off their shoulders knowing that at any point, if health changed, if there was a family event that needed caring to or tending to, if there was anything that prompted them to retire because it was needed, they felt really good knowing that before this, they had no idea this could happen, but they walked away from that meeting fully knowing that they could retire if they really needed to. Now we continued the conversation a bit and they said, you know what? It's, it's good to know we can retire, but let's go back to work until 65 because we enjoy work well enough. Let's actually see what would happen if we just continued doing this. Well, that's right back to where we started. You're right back to being projected or having a projected ending portfolio balance of about $9 million. So if you are going to work that long, where else can we make some changes to your plan? Well, number one, we could say, could you spend more in retirement? What if you spend $7,500 per month instead of 5,500? So an extra $24,000 per year, you could do that. And I don't want to say minimal impact to your plan because those are big numbers that we're looking at, $2.2 million but doesn't actually change the outcome of anything. You can still fully fund everything. It just means there's a little less in your portfolio at the end of the day. So this is where I took them back to what they shared with me at the beginning. They didn't want their children to have the burden of trying to save for retirement and paying the mortgage and living in a high cost of living area and trying to save for grandchildren's retirement or grandchildren's college. So I said, look, what, what if you were able to, they had five grandchildren, I said, what if you could put 4,000 per year for each of them into their 529 plans between now and the time they go to college. So what you're doing is everything else is equal, but you're spending $20,000 per year. But for a limited period of time, what we see is the proposed plan. You're still in a very strong place. There's a little less money at the end of the day, but you're able to do everything that you wanted to do. So as I've said before in videos like this, the goal of this isn't to say, John and Jane, here's exactly what you need to do for the rest of your life. The goal of this is to spark some conversations that maybe we haven't really had before. What is actually important to us? Do we want to retire sooner and embark on an adventure that we've been looking forward to? Be able to take care of ourselves and our health like we haven't been able to in the past? Do we want to work as long as we think we might want to? But be able to be generous with children or grandchildren. Be able to be generous with charity or church. Be able to spend more than we thought we might want to spend. What this really helps people to do is when you see what's possible, you can start to bring that back to today and say, what should we change doing today to make sure that we're fully using everything that we've saved and invested for over the course of our lifetime? So we continued from here with John and Jane to say, how do we maximize your tax strategy? How do we make sure we have the right insurance plan in place, the right estate plan in place, the right withdrawal strategy in place? But it all stems from this. How do we align your retirement vision with what's actually most important to you? How do we not just keep going based upon default assumptions we have about how long we need to work or how much we should spend? And how do we start applying much more intentionality towards that? So that's the thing that first and foremost people need to do, whether you have $2 million in your portfolio or any amount in your portfolio, this is the same framework that you should be looking at that with. Now you might be watching this video and saying, wow, that looks pretty cool. I wonder if I'm in a position to where I might be able to retire sooner rather than later. Well, take a look at this video right here. What I do in this video is I share with you five reasons you should retire right now. I'm not saying everyone's in the financial position to do so, but assuming you are, here's five reasons you should think about retiring right now. Some of them might surprise you, and I invite you to check it out. Once again, I'm James Knoll, founder of Root Financial, and if you're interested in seeing how we help our clients at Root Financial get the most out of life with their money, be sure to visit us at www.rootfinancialpartners.com.